I'm going to be talking today about a couple different things. I'm going to be talking about databases. I'm going to be talking about event streams. I'm going to be talking about stream processing and some of the relationships between these things. I'm also going to be talking about some of the ongoing work in KSQL. But before I get into that, I want to step back and talk a little bit about the role of software and companies. So in 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote a blog post called Why Software is Eating the World. And the, the thesis was software was going to be playing a bigger role in our lives. A lot of the products and services that people use would you know, have much more software as, as part of them. And, and this has really played out. I think the um, set of kind of large successful tech companies, the set of emerging startups, the investment thesis behind a lot of them has, has been essentially this. Um, it's also the unifying idea behind a lot of the technology trends. So if you think about microservices or machine learning applications or the rise of the cloud, uh, you know, mobile connectivity, even just the explosion of SaaS applications, like all of these in some way are about software increasing its prevalence, its capabilities, what it's doing in the world. And it's not all good and it's not all bad, but it's, it's something that's definitely happening in the world. And when we think about what does this mean in the architecture of a company, um, I think that there's really two ways to think about this. There, there's kind of a weak form and a strong form. So the weak form is that you know, companies are using more software. And this is definitely true. Companies are using more software. This is kind of, you know, now we have Slack, therefore software is eating the world. Um, and, and it's true, we do have Slack. Um, and it's true that we have a lot more applications inside of companies, but it's not that interesting. Like, it doesn't really change much. We had applications before, now we have more of them. But I think that there's a stronger form of this statement, which is that in some sense, companies are becoming software, like the end-to-end -end process that a company performs as part of being a business is moving more into software. And you know, this can happen either because you know, the company is rebuilding itself in this way. It can happen because new challenger startups come and, and try and build it from scratch this way. But I think this is something that's really happening. So I'm, I'm going to go through a little bit um, about what I mean here, the difference between using software and becoming software. And, and to kind of illustrate that, I'll start with an example. So I'm going to give the example of, of getting a loan. So this is a process I went through when I first bought a house. So I, I kind of went to a mortgage broker, and I filled out some form. And it wasn't all on paper. Like, as I was doing this, the person was typing something into a computer, and there was lots of back and forth. And then this started this kind of slow, semi-manual process that involved different parts of the bank uh, to get this approval. And each part of the bank was clearly using pieces of software. And they had some business process that was kind of semi-automated, but ultimately this took several weeks, right? It was kind of a slow human thing. You don't really know where you're at, and then eventually it's like, okay, great, um, you, you know, you're approved. And you know, this is what I mean by using software. It's not like the bank didn't have lots of software, it did. But the process of actually approving a loan was kind of a human-centric thing with some automation. The, the role of software was to make the humans more productive. And I think that the world that we're moving into is one that's a little different. It's one where the actual process is really built in software. It's modeled in software. And it's not, it's not like there aren't lots of humans involved. You know, still, I think if you get a loan, you're going to talk to somebody about it. But, but I think that that flow from entering your application information into a UI um, to a set of services inside the bank that talk to each other to actually approve or deny this loan I think that this can be carried out largely in software. It makes sense. Once you have the information, managing the risk of the bank, credit checks, all of that can be done in a much more automated way, and it can be done much faster. And so I think, I think this is the world that we're moving towards. And I think it's a big deal. I think there's a lot of implications for this, not least of which for how we build software systems, for, for what the software is. Um, if we look at this world of using software, what is it ultimately about? It's about the user. It's about making a UI. That's really the goal, right? The UI kind of drives all the action. In fact, that's what an application is. It's, it's a screen that you click on, that you enter information into. Um, and so in this using software world, that's what everything centers around. And, and the kind of classic architecture uh, for this type of application is this kind of three-tier app, where you have a UI, you have some service, and then you have a back-end database. 
And the, the, the application and the database are kind of passive. They're waiting for the user to click something, to do something. That really drives all the action in the system. But the, the world we're moving to is a little different. In, in the world we're moving to, you know, it's much less likely that the UI is, is doing all the talking. It's much more likely that services are talking to each other. And you know, th this actually significantly changes things because it means that the user of the software um, is very often going to be more software. And, and that's very different because people and software are really different. They have different needs. They consume data in different ways. And, and this raises an interesting question, which is, you know, what does this mean for databases? Are databases set up for this new type of application? Do they, do they have all the capabilities they need? Um, you know, are, are, are they ready? And you would think, well, the answer must be yes. After all, we have hundreds of databases. They're, they're actually quite good. It's one of the best and most well-developed areas of infrastructure. Um, but I, I actually think that there's something missing. Uh, I think that all of these systems share kind of a fundamental assumption, which is that data is passive, that the data kind of sits in the database and it waits for the user to do work. It waits for the user to click a button which issues a query which looks up data. It, it waits in the database for you to enter something into a form and hit save. Ultimately, the role of a database, and this is so ingrained in our minds, this is how we would think of it, is, is passive. It, it kind of reacts to what humans do. And this has actually served us pretty well for what's been the mainstay of software, the, the kind of CRUD application where you're managing a set of records and creating and updating and deleting them uh, through a UI. This is classically what you know, the, all the early software applications were about. You know, the things that came on your desktop computer, the CRM, Salesforce, it's ultimately a, a UI to make a, a sales team more productive. And, you know, it, it supports just as well the kind of synchronous services that would back that kind of request response UI. So, you know, if you, if, if you have a REST service that needs to support a UI, it can also be this kind of synchronous request response. But I, I think that this isn't quite all we need in this world where companies are becoming software and where software is talking to other software. And, and I think the reason is because unless you have a user and a UI that's waiting there, then why would this interaction just be you know, at a particular point in time, right? Why would it be synchronous? Software is kind of there all the time. It's working all the time. It's doing things all the time. Users look at their, their interfaces only now and then. When I'm not looking at the interface, you know, I don't want anything to happen. But when I am, I want it to come right away. Um, but, but applications can consume from each other and, and actually do work in the background continuously. And so what's the answer you know, in, the, in this area? What do we need to add to this picture uh, to complete the infrastructure stack for these kind of modern applications? Well, obviously, we think the answer is event streams. That's, that's kind of what the conference is about. So it's, it's no surprise, right? And we think that these event streams can really form the basis for carrying all this activity in a company, what's happening in a company. This can really drive uh, applications, data systems. This can be kind of the central nervous system that all these things plug into. And you know, June talked a lot about this in the keynote yesterday. You know, it's been in a lot of the talks uh, that I've, I've been lucky enough to see. And you know, we think that Kafka really has the right abstraction to be a basis for this. This kind of commit log, this can be the representation of an event stream that everything plugs into and reads off of. So if we have this, is, is this all we need? Well, I, I think it's not. It's not quite all we need. This is actually an excellent foundation. But if you think about it, the core of Kafka is still pretty low level. It's kind of like a file system for event streams. You can seek around. You can append. You, know, you can read. Um, but if you think about applications, they, in that three-tier application uh, I showed, you know, they, they mostly aren't built directly on top of a file system. Most applications aren't just seeking around in reading and writing and munging individual bytes. They're, they're built with a database. And the database is meant to provide a much higher level of abstraction. And that's what's made application development so successful, is that you can build on a system that allows you to just declare what you want to happen and have it happen. And this, this is coming to this world of event streams, and it's come from the world of stream processing. You know? And you know, probably most people in the room are familiar with stream processing. This is the ability to take these real-time streams, 
do continuous transformation, aggregation, reaction, processing, and produce continuous out output streams. And there, there's a number of systems, uh, uh, open source and, and not, that are, that are available that do this. Um, you can hear about a bunch of them here at this conference. I'm going to be talking a little bit about KSQL, and I'll, I'll be talking about some of the things it does today, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that we're working on right now. And so KSQL is a SQL layer that lets you do now continuous queries on infinite streams. And to understand this, you need to understand the difference between a traditional database and event stream processing. So in a traditional database, I have kind of passive data sitting in a table. And I have an active query that comes in, and it does a lookup, or it does a select, it, it does an update, and then it goes away. It, it kind of scans through this data, computes the result, and gives it to the user. The user is the one that initiates everything, and then it goes away. In event stream processing, it's almost the opposite. The, the query is now passive. It just sits there processing all the time. It doesn't do any work until the data comes to it. When new data occurs, when new data arrives, more processing occurs. So now we have a passive query and, and active data. And you know, KSQL today, if you look at it, it it's very much uh, this, this latter category. It's, it's event stream processing. And so it, it really provides two key abstractions. It provides event streams, which are exactly what we would expect, right? So in this example, I have a stream of payments um, with users who are making those payments. And new payments can come all the time, and they just get appended to this stream. And in KSQL, you can filter and transform and, and aggregate these streams um, almost as if they were a kind of infinite table that just keeps getting longer and longer. Uh, but KSQL also supports tables. It supports collections. So I could take this stream, and I could compute something off of it. I could say, hey, let's take all the payments that users are making, and let's compute a credit score for each user. So I'm just going to have one entry for each user, and that, that entry is going to get updated every time they pay for something new. And so if I was doing this in KSQL, I can easily create a stream off of a, a Kafka topic and treat that now just like a, a kind of infinite table in, in KSQL. And I can materialize a, a computed table off of that. So here I have this create table statement where I'm taking all the payments and I'm computing some kind of credit score with a, a credit scoring UDF um, on top of that. And this, this query actually goes on forever. It doesn't finish. It just continues to update that table. And that table is always up to date with the latest credit score. And of course, a, a real credit scoring algorithm would probably be much more complicated. You would probably join together lots of pieces of information to serve this. But, but for illustrative purposes, this is kind of a simple version of it. So then you would ask, OK, great. So we have now a SQL layer for stream processing. You know, are we good to go? Have we, have we solved the problem? Do, do we have everything that we need to make it really easy and productive to develop in this new world? Well, I think we still don't. So th this, is, this is much more useful than just seeking around in a Kafka stream and, and writing individual messages. Right? This is more productive than that. Um, but, but some things are still hard. And the reason that they're still hard, I think, is because we still have a lot of synchronous applications. It's not like users and UIs have gone away. So we've added this event streaming area, uh, but we still also have lots of synchronous applications. And you know, to serve both of these, I really, if I think about it, I have two different types of query. So what KSQL is doing is kind of like a push query, where it continues to compute all the time and it pushes out results continuously. So in that credit scoring example, it's giving a series of updates for all the credit scores as they occur. A traditional database, on the other hand, does what's more like a pull query. The application kind of goes and pulls a result. It says, hey, what's the credit score for J right now? And it looks it up. Uh, but to do these two different types of queries, and, and the domain just needs this. Anything which is continual needs push queries. And any application with a UI needs pull queries. But to do these two things, I effectively need two different systems. Uh, and KSQL is providing this kind of push query, which is, which is a new thing. But to do something that's a pull, I need a traditional database. I need something like Postgres or, or whatever. And where it gets tricky is that to integrate all of these into one application actually has kind of a lot of moving parts. So in this flow, this is, this is actually the architecture of most event streaming applications that have any UI component that show anything to a user. 
So on this side, I'm going to have my source databases and applications. And on this side, I'm going to have an application which displays something in a UI. And what I need to do now is kind of capture the events, maybe extract them with some connectors from databases. Maybe I'm using Kafka Connect. And I'm going to store those in Kafka. And then I can run continuous processing on those to materialize something new. Maybe this is my credit scoring. And now to serve that up in a UI, I have to actually load it into a traditional database. Right? Maybe this is Postgres. And then my application can do lookups against this. So you know, in a sense, I have kind of a, a set of stages here where I'm extracting streams, I'm storing the streams, I'm transforming the streams, I'm loading them into a traditional database, and I'm serving queries against them. And you know, so, so what's wrong with this? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. It works, and there's a lot of useful applications built in this way. But it's a little bit complicated, right? I, I mean, I'm a guy who likes distributed systems. But if I have to have like five distributed systems for my one application, that's kind of a lot. And you know, I would be excused for thinking, well, you know, that three-tier architecture wasn't perfect, but at least it only had three tiers, right? Uh, I, I would love to get down to three tiers in this picture. So what could I do? How, how could we simplify this? And is that important? Is it worth doing? Well, I think it's really important. I think you know, if we want to make this area of event streaming, if we want to make that mainstream, we have to make it easy. We have to make it simple. We have to make it elegant and, and, and easy to build on. I think we need to learn from the more complicated ecosystems that have emerged in areas like Hadoop that are just really difficult to build applications on, that have so many moving pieces that are hard to secure and hard to, to build around. And we have to try and build something that, that's, that's easier. And so I think this is a critical project. And a lot of the work I think happening in the Kafka community, a lot of the work that Confluence is trying to contribute to is really trying to drive to this, whether it's our cloud product and trying to make it easy to, to get Kafka and consume it, um, whether it's some of the work I'm going to be describing, whether it's the removal of Zookeeper that, that June talked about yesterday, where we're really trying to simplify the stack and make it as easy as possible. So what I'm going to talk about today is some ongoing work that, that we're doing to try and make it easier to build this type of application that's happening in KSQL. And you, you can go check out the code. You can see the discussions here. The, the code is there. And we'll, we'll show kind of a demo of this. And what this does is really two things. So it adds to KSQL two capabilities. The first is the ability to actually control Kafka Connect connectors directly from SQL. So in a single line of SQL, I can actually connect to some system and extract changes or, or load streams out into a system. And it also adds the ability to do lookups on top of the computed tables, so that if I materialize some data set in a KSQL table, I can do point lookups for individual keys of what's the current value for this. And you know, what that allows me to do now is take this more complicated architecture and actually remove a bunch of the pieces so that I, I can have KSQL directly control the connectors to capture changes. Uh, it can do the kind of continuous processing and materialization. And then it can actually serve queries for the application to drive a UI. So I've brought together this event streaming world and the more traditional you know, database world in, into one system. And that, that means that I can have both these push and pull queries together. And so pull queries. Uh, just like in a normal database, it, they work with the syntax you would expect if you say select this. It, it does an individual lookup. But if I add this line now that says emit changes, then it doesn't stop. It actually just continues to give me all the changes to that table or stream as they occur. So we're, we're going to show a, a quick demo uh, of some of this work now. Hey, Tim here. Now, I'm not on stage. I'm just inside this demo. And I want to show you some of what Jay has just been talking about. Now, to give you an idea of what you're going to see, imagine a simple e-commerce application. There's just going to be two elements to this. One is purchases that are happening out in the world. And that's naturally an event stream, right? We're going to model that as a stream. The other is users making those purchases. And those users are going to be in a table, naturally. So with that in mind, Let's take a look. Let's create that users table down in Postgres and insert a few users. There's Ale and Victor and Jay and uh, there's me. And we're going to go up here and create 
a Kafka Connect connector from within KSQL. That's what that line does. That's all set up now and producing into that topic called JDBC users. Now we'll create a KSQL table to wrap around it, take a look at what's in there, and there we are. Anyway, next step is we're gonna create a stream for the purchases. There's a merchant, there's the username, and there's the amount of the purchase. There aren't any purchases in there yet, as you can see here. There's no data in this stream yet. So I'm gonna go to this other KSQL console here and insert some things. Looks like Ale made a purchase and Victor made a purchase and Jay bought a pumpkin spice latte and I bought some photo gear. That all looks perfectly normal. Now let's see what we can do with that. I wanna join that purchases stream to the users table so we can get merchant and amount and all that purchase stuff joined with the user data. And when we take a look at that table, we see it all right there, it's enriched. We see my bad credit score, we see Jay's pumpkin spice latte, it's all there. And as people buy more things and those purchases are inserted into that purchases topic, that purchases stream, we see them show up in the joined table immediately. We can do some more analytics. Here I'm gonna group by username and see what the total purchases are that each person has done. And so we're counting the purchases and grouping up the unique purchase amounts that each user has made. You can get an idea kind of of the, the sort of purchase history that each person has made. And looks like Ollie went to build a bear, Jay bought a big TV that looks like, uh, and as those things arrive, they show up right away uh, in that aggregate. And we can also go to that table and interrogate individual rows. We're calling this a pull query. This looks like just a query of a table where I can specify a row key and pretty much instantly grab that row back and that history of those users' purchases. Jay, back to you. So I think this is really cool. You know, in, in that demo, it's a simple demo, and we're just doing simplistic lookups, but we've actually built an end-to-end -end streaming application uh, with just a few lines of SQL. Uh, and I think that's a huge step in trying to make this, this easier. Um, and so I, I think that this makes a lot of sense from the user's point of view, but I'm actually going to argue that this is really a kind of natural generalization of databases, that in some sense this, this functionality belongs together. And you know, I think there's a couple of different ways we could argue that, right? I, I think one way to argue it is, well, you know, all of these streaming applications are kind of following an architecture like that, and bringing together those capabilities is very natural. Um, you know, it, it makes sense that you have kind of a single database for, for a single app. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to make another argument around this from the point of view of what's inside the box. So, so we don't usually think about what's kind of behind the SQL queries. But if you look internally at the architecture of a distributed database, you often see something like this, where there's serving nodes that have kind of materialized data in some format. Maybe it's a B tree, maybe, you know, maybe it's something more modern. And these are actually serving queries. And then this database is actually committing changes to some kind of log. So not all distributed databases work this way, but this is, you know, I think, one of the more common architectures and, and arguably one of the better architectures. And the log is providing this kind of consistent representation of the changes coming in and is broadcasting them out so that all of these nodes stay in sync. And so that if one of them were to fail, the others have data and can take over. So, so this is the architecture of a distributed database. And we're kind of now going to look at the architecture of a distributed stream processing system. And this is actually not that different. So a stream processor is now taking you know, events from this log. It's taking a stream of changes, and these individual processing nodes are going to process and react to those changes. But the stream processor is very likely going to need some kind of persistent state if it's going to do anything that covers more than one row. If it's going to do aggregations or joins or any of the multi-row activities, it's going to need to materialize state of its own. And that state, if you want to have failover, between instances of the stream processor, that state is also going to have to be highly available. And so the way that in Kafka streams in KSQL, the way that this is made highly available is by, again, committing those changes to a commit log to Kafka, right? And allowing them to be replicated on other nodes so that if one node fails, there can be other kind of highly available instances of that that can take over. 
And so we can see, you know, a stream processor is actually, if it's built right, it's actually not very different from a distributed database. It's kind of like a database being run almost in reverse. And so, you know, if you put these two things together, um, I, I think it's actually very natural and powerful. You get uh, a version of KSQL that kind of works in, in both directions. And I think this is a very powerful thing. I think it changes, in some sense, what KSQL is from being a kind of streaming engine, almost like a SQL dialect for using Kafka streams, to something more general, a kind of event streaming database. And you know, this actually makes a lot of sense. You're, you're issuing remote queries to a system that's materializing and storing distributed state uh, that's avail available to do processing. And, and so I think this is actually a really natural generalization of what databases do. And to illustrate that, I want to compare it to a more traditional area of databases. I want to compare it to data warehousing. So, you know, obviously the, the, the goal of KSQL is not to go become your data warehouse. But I think by looking at this area, we can actually learn something about what's possible in this area. So a data warehouse is you know, made up of two key entities. It's made up of fact tables and dimension tables. And a dimension table is you know, all the entities in your business. It's the products and customers and so on. A fact table is actually a really interesting thing, if you've ever thought about it. A fact table is a kind of time-ordered sequence of things that happened in the business. It's immutable. You just append new facts and you always add to it. So it, it seems a little bit familiar to people who are used to event streams, because of course that's just a kind of very slow, batch-oriented, non-subscribable event stream. And I think it's illustrative that in data warehousing, in order to represent a business, they had to actually kind of reinvent event streams in, in a very slow way. And now, inside of a data warehouse, what is it? It's a kind of materialized view of things that are happening in the business. It's you know, very highly processed data. And on one side, you're able to serve these kind of reports using pull queries that go and, and look up results in the database. And the database actually does this really well. It has a whole query processor and language for serving that. But now if we look on the other side of, hey, how do we get this materialized view? How do we attach to all the systems in the business? How do we do all the computation to get that data into the right format? We realize actually the database doesn't really help with that. It can't really do it. And so, you either end up running a bunch of batch SQL processing to try and fake it, or you hook on some kind of jury-rigged ETL solution. And I would argue that most ETL products are, are kind of the world's worst stream processing you know, with, a, with a UI on top. And, and so you're, you're kind of trying to build this other side of the database, but you're trying to build it by gluing on external products. And the result is something which isn't continuous. It's not up to date with the state of the business. And the result is that although it's great for serving that report that you look at in the morning that tells you what happened yesterday, um, which is great in a company that's kind of using bits of software here and there to get analytics, it's not so good for actually operating the business. It's not as good for this kind of world of becoming software, for directly driving applications and processes that are carrying out parts of the business. And that's why, really, a data warehouse can't be this kind of central nervous system for a digital business. It's a powerful thing. It's a basis for analytics. I think it remains incredibly important and successful. But that central nervous system of where all the data comes together increasingly is becoming this kind of event streaming platform. And we think that KSQL, especially with these new features, really can play an important role in this ecosystem in making it really easy to capture and transform and load and serve these kind of event streaming apps that are emerging around this. So what does this mean for all these other databases? Do we still need these? The answer is, yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. What, what we're adding in KSQL is really you know, just very simple lookups. I, I, I think that serves simple applications. It makes it more accessible. But all of these support, you know, first of all, all source of truth storage and, and really complex queries of different kinds. Right? And these changes in KSQL actually help you use these as well. So, so the upstream databases that are storing your data are going to remain these traditional systems, most likely. And, and uh, KSQL is going to be helping to do processing downstream. In some cases, it may be serving results. But in cases where you need more complex queries, something like a search index or analytics capabilities, you can now actually hook up connectors and stream data into them in a single query. So, so this is an example of streaming changes, uh, transforming them and loading them into Elasticsearch 
uh, to serve an application. I, th I think this is incredibly powerful and makes this much easier to use. So this is work that we're incredibly excited about. It's, it's ongoing. You can go see the code there now. Um, we're, we're hoping to get a first release out in November. Um, a lot more to do there. You know, this initial uh, release is just doing kind of simple queries, but we hope to take it from there. We think it's really a major thing going forward and is going to have a huge role in the future of companies as event streaming comes to the fore. Thank you so much. And next up, I'm going to welcome to the stage uh, Dave Tagare, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the streaming platform at Lyft and the team that he runs there. So welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. So maybe you could start and tell us a little bit about your role at Lyft and your experiences with open source and, and what led you to this? Right. Uh, so I've been with Lyft for about a year now. Uh, I am one of the engine managers on the stream platform team. We do everything from uh, ingestion to pops up to fan outs to persistence uh, all in real time. Uh, what brought me to Lyft? I think it was uh, scaling distributed systems uh, with really low end-to-end uh, -end latencies. And Lyft is a real-time and a streaming-first company, so that was really uh, interesting for me to sort of pursue. Yeah, it's one of the most fascinating use cases for event streams in my mind. Um, you know, I really think in that uh, dichotomy of kind of using software and becoming software, you know, this is a company that really started fresh, uh, taking something that we knew, which is how do you get a ride somewhere, and, and turning it into an end-to-end software-driven experience. And one of the most interesting kind of real-time logistics challenges to route all these cars all around the world globally and optimize all the pickups. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about the technology evolution at Lyft. You know, where did you start? Where, where are you at today? Kind of where are you going? What's, what's the event streaming you know, stack look like for you guys? Sure. Uh, so Lyft uh, basically uh, has been a Kinesis shop for a really long time, and we still continue to be. At the same time, we sort of realized that if we wanted to index on lower tail latencies like 50 ms or under, uh, we couldn't really you know, continue being on a single pop sub stack. At that point, that was really uh, unlocking new use cases that uh, sort of took us to Kafka. And with uh, adding Kafka with, in addition to Kinesis at Lyft, what we were able to do was uh, get really, really uh, cool end-to-end -end latencies, 50 ms and lower. At the same time, we could uh, sort of leverage high fan outs, which usually end up being expensive. You have to write some systems to take a stream of events, fan them out to different uh, consumers or downstream applications. These could be microservices. These could be some real-time decision-making uh, models, pricing models, uh, ETA models. Um, so we didn't really want to manage all of that infrastructure anymore. And it gets clunkier and clunkier as you add more and more microservices. Uh, that was basically our tipping point, and we said, okay, we need to add Kafka to the toolkit, and it's really unlocked a bunch of use cases for us. And, and where do you think it's going? Do you think you'll be using more Kafka in the future? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Kafka usage is uh, definitely on the rise. Uh, we started last year with a vendor managed solution, uh, Con Confluent Cloud, and then uh, further along, we sort of went down the path of adding in house Kafka support as well. And as of today, we're running between Confluent Cloud and our in-house clusters, about 11 clusters. And uh, Kafka is taking close to 100 billion rides a day now. That's awesome. And anything you can tell me about these use cases in more depth? What, what are some of the things that you're using event streams to do? And, and what's you know, some of the volume and scale uh, for these users? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of volume and scale, we, depending on the time of day, uh, day of the week, uh, in a given day, we do about 95 to 150, 160 billion events. Um, most of this is real time. They feed into either real time decision making uh, services or microservices, or they sometimes get into real time or near real time persistence paths, uh, or they're just found out uh, to something like a location on your cell phone, which is one of the coolest use cases we have with Kafka running today. And it was really Kafka that sort of enabled that use case. What happens is uh, we have a bunch of location ingestion services, 
they feed into a Kafka cluster, and what we end up doing is we take all of that data, we try to map match a user location with a road segment to correctly know inter inter which intersection, which side of the road you're on, stuff like that, uh, because all of those decisions go into dispatching a ride for you, or if you're one of the passengers uh, in a shared ride, then we want to know that, oh, it's a one way, you're on this side of the road, so right. map you to the right segment. Uh, for those use cases, well, after we persist all those locations in Kafka, we run parallel models. Yeah. Now, these are models which run with a fan out factor of 100, 200, 500 sometimes, and the best model wins. It accurately matches you to the right segment of the road, and then from that point on, you're either matched with a, uh, the right driver, or if you're a driver, you're matched with the right uh, rider. Uh, and that's, that model wins. That uh, projected location is sent back to your cell phone, uh, both for the rider and the passenger. And then uh, one cool thing that happens is the little car that moves on your screen, Kafka powers that car. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your approach at Lyft towards managed services. So when I was at LinkedIn, you know, we, we kind of, I guess, copied Google and we, we wanted to build everything in-house. You know, now the world is very different where there's much more available in open source. There's, you know, kind of managed offerings that you can get in the cloud that are just kind of run and scaled for you. Like, how do you, how do you guys think about that? When do you choose one or the other? Right. I mean, technology at Lyft is very democratic. Uh, we believe in, like, having a different, uh, you know, array of tools in our toolkit. Really, so the reason we chose a vendor-based offering when we first started being Confluent Cloud was we more immediately wanted to unlock some of the mission critical and high business value or business impact use cases. Uh, for those, usually we index on high levels of reliability, uh, better availability guarantees, and just sometimes you know uh, things go wrong and you need uh, vendor coverage and vendor support. So anything that is uh, user-facing, ride-impacting, uh, needs really high latency and durability guarantees, uh, we index on vendor support. That's great. For some of the lower uh, high velocity but lower uh, sort of importance use cases, we did invest in adding some in-house tooling, and we spun up in-house yeah. Kafka as well. And and what's, you know, is there any way to characterize the, the impact of this transition to Kafka? Like, what has what it, you know, done for the business? Is, is there anything that can be said about that? Right, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the pivot to Kafka or adding Kafka to our toolkit uh, basically unlocked a bunch of use cases that would normally have not been unlocked. Like, if you want to do map matching in under 100 MS, you need to have locations data sent out to the routing models uh, within 30, 40 MS. That means your write latency plus your consume latency needs to be an order of magnitude lower than uh, some of like the previous pub subsystems. They guaranteed about 500 ms v99s. Uh, you need it to be within 50 ms. So yeah. that's the stuff yeah. that got unlocked for us. Uh, the car really moved smoothly because we could do that in 100 yeah. ms. So. Um, another thing that it unlocked for us on the uh, AV front was uh, we sort of like map these images and index them in S3. And after that, we run a bunch of image processing models. Uh, those run with fan out factors of 2,000. Yeah. Uh, when you need low, low latencies and higher fan out factors with economics of scale, like Kafka was a natural choice for us. That's great. So Kafka is in that path towards self-driving cars then. Definitely is, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so any advice that you would have for your peers um, based on the experiences you guys have had so far? Anything that you want to share uh, about what you've learned or, or what's coming up? Yeah, so uh, in terms of just uh, advice to the peers, I, what I would say is be realistic about uh, your use case, what Kafka can do for you and what it cannot do for you. Uh, don't try to over-engineer with Kafka. Like it's, it's a tool that works really well. At Lyft, we sort of philosophically think about Kafka as a reliability tool, uh, as in it transports data from point A to point B reliably. It's always available. Uh, so we really invested in a lot of tooling around Kafka. We have a offset lag monitor, end-to-end uh, -end latency monitors, uh, rebalancers, uh, and remediators. So for some of our in-house Kafka tooling, uh, that's a thing that we invested in, wherein if there's a network partition fault, the remediator kicks in and spins up, uh, re restarts the process or spins up a node. 
So stuff like that I would definitely advise everyone who wants to use Kafka to work on. And just be honest about your SLOs. Sometimes you just don't need all those eight nines. Yeah, that's great. Well, for anybody who wants to learn more uh, about Kafka at Lyft, uh, I believe you're going to be doing a talk later this afternoon, and, and people definitely. should check out that session. Yeah, definitely. All right. Looking forward. Thank you so great. much. Thank you. And I'd like to invite up here next somebody who's been instrumental in the building of Confluent Cloud. Uh, to talk a little bit about what's coming next with that. And that is uh, my colleague, my friend, uh, Priya Shivakumar. Priya, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Tim. Hello, everyone. As Tim mentioned, my primary focus at Confluent has been our cloud product. It's been an interesting journey with many learnings along the way. And I'd love to share with you some of the thinking behind the product direction we set for Confluent Cloud. So let's take a look at the differences between an open source distributed system like Apache Kafka and a cloud native service with AWS uh, Kinesis as an example, another streaming service, but one born in the cloud. Most of you have experienced Kafka as software that you would download and run with many knobs to configure and manage. Think of security, replication, disaster recovery, sizing, capacity planning, etc. As a cloud-native service, Kinesis, on the other hand, makes it easy to get started with streaming, grow as you go, and take advantage of granular, flexible pricing. All of us here understand the value of Kafka, the power that it brings, and the ecosystem around it. And make no mistake, our customers want Kafka as well but they also want the ease of use and the cloud-native benefits of a service like Kinesis. And we think they shouldn't have to choose. They shouldn't have to make these trade-offs. So let's take a look at some of the deployment options uh, available for Kafka. On the far left, you have the do-it-yourself option or the self-managed option, wherein you would handle, or you or your DevOps team would handle all of the complexity yourself. An alternative is a managed service or a cloud service. But most of the managed services today for Kafka do little more than stand up clusters in the cloud, with none of the cloud native attributes that we just talked about. They also fall short in offloading the ops burden because most are partially managed or semi managed. They provide Kafka brokers on a variety of instances. 24-7 monitoring, and some form or flavor of an SLA or an uptime guarantee, one that might or might not cover the entire platform. They also do not manage the ecosystem components like schema registry, connectors, case SQL, et cetera. So they're one step removed from do it yourself. They get you started. But on an ongoing basis, most of the Kafka-specific management itself falls right back on the user, including expanding Kafka clusters, tuning for latency should your use case require it, managing schema registry, connectors, or case equal if you want to, and so on. So we saw this gap between open source systems and cloud native benefits. And this is why we set out to re-engineer Kafka for the cloud and make it serverless, the next category on the spectrum. The idea is to lower the entry barrier for Kafka and enable a greater focus on the problems that you're trying to solve, on the business logic that drives differentiation for your company. Kafka should not just be for tech giants with large IT teams and deep pockets. It should have all of the cloud-native benefits required to enable a simpler and an adop easier adoption path. As a company, we are trying to make event streaming simpler across the board. You heard June talk about removing the zookeeper for a simpler architecture. Jay shared his vision of streams and databases fundamentally being joined together for a simple real-time data platform, one that can power a software-defined company of the future. And the third aspect of simplification is this, which enables an easier, simpler adoption path for Kafka. So as a result of this re-engineering and the adopted serverless properties, Confluent Cloud radically simplifies the whole experience of building Kafka-based applications. 
you no longer have to worry about brokers or cluster configuration. Capacity planning becomes a thing of the past as your system scales elastically with your workload, and you pay for what you stream, not for idle capacity. Let's take an example of a retail use case for a minute. It's conceivable that you'd have traffic spikes around the holidays, with your highest spike probably around Thanksgiving. In the absence of serverless, you'd have to provision capacity for that Thanksgiving spike and pay for it all year round. Even if you didn't have a spiky traffic pattern, but let's say you wanted to bring on more use cases later on down the path, and that's very common with Kafka, it grows organically. Or your, or your application naturally grew its user base. In either of these cases, you still have to plan for that capacity, wouldn't you? Or you have to be prepared to expand the Kafka cluster manually. But expanding a Kafka cluster manually is not a trivial exercise. As you add more nodes, you have to balance data across the cluster, and that requires transferring terabytes worth of data over the network, which takes time, sometimes hours. And as you're doing that, you have to make sure not to overwhelm the client. And if your traffic spikes before you can expand the cluster, you run the risk of downtime or data loss. Let's take a look at how Confluent Cloud works. Hey, Tim here, once again, not on stage, just inside this demo to show you what Priya's been talking about. You can see here we have a pretty standard signup flow. You put in your credit card, choose your cloud provider. Here, I've chosen GCP and US Central Region to get started. The pricing screen shows you unit prices by cloud provider and region. For the core Kafka service, we have three simple dimensions of pricing. That's dollars per gigabyte in, dollars per gigabyte out, and dollars per gigabyte stored. There's no price for servers or brokers. These things are entirely abstracted away. So uh, an example, if you were to stream one gigabyte of data in, retained that gigabyte for a whole month and did nothing else, which isn't very exciting, but this is your application, this would cost you exactly 11 cents for that data in, 10 cents to store the partition times three for replication for a total of 41 cents on your bill that month. Beyond that, there are no minimums. There's no commitment required. You pay as you go just for consumption and you don't pay for anything else. Everything scales to zero just as a proper serverless service should. Next, you can create your topic. And here we're creating a topic for orders from a web application. Yes, we made that example up ourselves. And we're gonna start streaming data in, and you can see those orders are coming in. And as you can see, schema registry is baked in as a part of Confluent Cloud. So you can register your schema right there in the UI. As you scale your usage of Kafka, you can use our fully managed connectors or any of the ecosystem connectors to connect Confluent Cloud with any data source or sync that you want. Here, we're using our fully managed GCS sync connector to move our orders from Confluent Cloud into Google Cloud Storage. Once you've built your basic data pipeline, you can use fully managed KSQL to process these unbounded streams with millisecond latency. Now in the frankly unlikely event that you haven't heard us talking about it yet, KSQL is a thing that provides simple SQL-like semantics for filtering, transforming, aggregating data, creating derivative streams of the source data with the results. In this example, we're aggregating order amounts by day to understand how much revenue our little web store is bringing in each day. Now, let's say you're running steadily at 60 gigabytes per week at the rate of 0.1 megabytes per second. That amounts to about $15 per week. But your company runs a marketing promotion or there's some other strange viral event that causes your traffic to spike to 60 megabytes, which is more than a 100x increase in load for just an hour. And then it dies down. I mean, stranger things have happened. And frankly, this isn't even all that strange. Well, in this case, what's Confluent Cloud going to do? What it does is it scales elastically with this load in essentially real time. Notice consumer lag going up here. That's because Confluent Cloud is handling the increased load so seamlessly that now our consumers have a lot more to do because of this spike in traffic. We don't have to worry about scaling our infrastructure. Instead, we're focused on our application that's reading from Kafka. We're focused on scaling those consumers, just like we should be. This spike in load for an hour would cost you about $80 additional for that hour, and then you go right back down to your normal run rate of $15 per week. Priya, back to you. 
So that's Confluent Cloud with its serverless properties, uh, elastic scaling pay for use, and also full management for the complete event streaming platform, the core Kafka service, as well as the ecosystem components. Starting now, we're also offering Try free with Confluent Cloud on any cloud provider of your choice, GCP, Azure, or AWS. Every sign up, every new sign up gets $50 uh, free per month uh, for three months from sign up. As your Kafka scales and reaches a steady state, you can make a commitment, uh, an annual commitment, in exchange for significant discounts uh, on these list prices. If your needs are not met by the standard setup in Confluent Cloud, for example, you want to spike to more than 100 megabytes per second, or you, need, you have a need for a specific networking architecture, like a multi-VPC peering or transit gateway, or you're looking to build a hybrid cloud data pipeline, one that connects data on premises to your cloud data and keeps it all in sync in near real time, you can utilize our custom setup, or also known as the enterprise plan. So when it comes to Confluent Cloud, you don't have to make all or nothing decisions. You can take advantage of all of the power of Kafka and its ecosystem without compromising on any of the benefits of cloud native. Thank you so much for listening to me. And do give Confluent Cloud a try. And we'd love to hear from you at serverless at confluent.io. Thank you.